friends. Okay, here we go again. Hey, hello, my friends. How are you guys doing today? You guys know me. My name is Beto Gudinho, the avatar, because the real Beto Gudinho is actually putting his quesadillas in the microwave right now. But I'm the avatar, and I'm so excited to be here with you guys today on the internet. As you know, yesterday was frustration for the whole world. Facebook was down. The internet was broken, right? And for all of us that live here on cyberspace, that's just a no-no, because this is our life right here, the ones and zeros. So today we have a special episode. We're gonna talk about something that personally as an avatar, I don't like, but I think Beto Gudinho, the real Beto Gudinho, loves this stuff because it has to do with slowing down. Actually, one of the questions we can talk about today is, can we slow down in cyberspace? Can we? Because cyberspace, it's about fast, 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 and more, 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 right? And today's topic is Jesus is always late. What does it mean that Jesus is always late? I feel like when we, for, for a lot of people to experience God is like, I don't like God, right? Because when I do my own thing, I can go at my own pace and I can trust my own efforts and abilities and I can make it happen. Why should I put, or why should I even have a God help me? He's too busy, right? He's doing other things. I can do it on my own. So today's topic is this idea of what is God's speed? What if God has a pace? What does it mean? And we have a special guest that we're going to introduce to you right now. His name is Matt Canlis. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks to your prayer before it started, and I'm pleased to be on the show. Thanks, Peto. Awesome, Matt. Well, Matt, you're in Wenatchee, Washington, living the the slow paced life. And the cool thing about this is that we've been talking for about two weeks already. And when I said, Matt, I want you to be on the podcast, on the show, you said, well, can we talk first? Can we kind of get to know each other first? And I felt like, That was so inspiring to me because in the cyberspace world, everything is so quick. Everything is about, there's going to be an expert and he's going to give us the, the five things we need to be better humans, faster humans, to do more with our abilities, whatever it might be. Um, and you said, well, let's slow down from the beginning, right? Let's not rush into a podcast. Let's talk. Let's get to know each other. And I love that because even in the in the talking with one another, I feel like this is a podcast itself. It's just not being broadcasted, but it's, it's amazing because basically a podcast is interacting with a person relationally and learning something from them. So Matt, would you tell us a little bit about what you do, um, what it is that you do, what does it look like in your parish in Wenatchee? Yeah, so I'm a pastor. I'm 49 years old. I got four kids. We live in a place called Wenatchee, which is in the middle of Washington State. And what do I do? Um, I walk the parish. I talk to people. I pray with them. I prepare sermons. Although last Sunday, my wife preached for the first time, which was a great gift. Wow. And... One reason I do all this is because I'm trying to not be online or not be present on screens as much as I am face to face. In fact, I didn't know what you just said about Facebook being down. Um, I'm glad, Beto, that you are on the airwaves and finding ways to communicate. But this is a world that maybe because of my own temptations, I have not been a part of. So I don't have Facebook or Instagram or different things. And so thanks for the time it took for you and I to get to know each other on the phone talking. And you got to see the parish. I think I pulled over right by Metal Market and showed you the mural where people have painted things. So I feel like you're getting to know where I live. Thank you. Yes, I am getting to know where you live. And 
That was so beautiful, Matt. Um, just getting to know you. One one of the times we were talking on the phone, you even said it was just the phone, right? It was no screens like right now. And I could hear you kind of like hustling a little bit. I'm like, oh, what what is it that you're doing right now? And you said, well, I'm folding laundry, right? <laughs> <laughs> so even as we today, we discover a little bit of these rhythms of, of God uh, or Godspeed to acknowledge that even in the mundane, even in the day-to-day, -day, even in the what some people might even call the mediocre, the the regular daily life, we can experience the pace of God. And I mean, right here I have a book that you wrote along with your wife called Godspeed, and it's an eight-week video and study guide. And for people that want to check it out, you can check it out at uh, livegodspeed.org. But we were watching these videos along with some people from our congregation and other congregations from our, it's called so SoCal Network. And as we were watching these videos, I mean, two of my heroes are in these videos, right? One was Eugene Peterson and N.T. Wright. And then as, I'm, as we're watching these videos, of course, you're, you're kind of like the the headliner of the video because you're in a parish in Scotland and you're talking about this this rhythm of getting to know people. And I think this was very inspiring because, uh, well, first, you were mentored by an amazing person, right? Eugene Peterson. And even before him, you said you were mentored, mentored by Jim Houston. Uh, before we go into what is a parish, Could you tell us a little bit about this relationship with Jim Houston and Eugene Peterson? What did it mean for you? How did it come to happen? Yes, um, it came to happen just because my wife and I, who both grew up in the church, loving Jesus, begun to be deconstructed a little bit because of our fundamentalist roots. And a mentor, another guy named Skip Lee said, you guys should go to Regent College up in Vancouver. So my wife and I got married. We took this honeymoon trip to seminary because, I don't know, we're Christian geeks and thought that would be fun. <laughs> and we were wrestling wow. with our faith. And so at Regent, yeah. Jim Houston, who was the teacher there, um, saw us as a new couple and said, you need to meet with me once a week on Thursdays for lunch. So Jim began to be a trusted man of God who also helped us think about the faith, not just feel it. Ours was a more feeling-based faith. We wanted to combine our mind with our heart. Well, when Jim retired, Eugene moved in, and he took Jim's professorship, and we were just in a class with Eugene when I raised my hand trying to impress him that I had a smart question. Well, this took like three classes for me to think of a smart question. And I raised my hand trying to look kind of not over interested, just kind of a casual wave. But I was so excited that he would see me and maybe get to know me because um, he just came out with the message. And so I was a fan of his. And he looked at me and he'd never met me. And he said, Matt, what's your question? And I was so surprised that he knew my name, that I forgot my question, uh, had an embarrassing moment, and later learned that he knew my name because Eugene would always leave his house 20 minutes early so that if he bumped into you on the way to class, he would have time to talk. It turned out he had bumped into my wife. He had learned her name, Julie. She had learned the husband's name, Matt. And now that we were sitting side by side in class holding hands, he guessed that must be Matt. So both with Jim and Eugene, we were just befriended by generous men who took time to know our names and invest in us. Wow. Yeah, that's so good. And, you know, when, I, when you mentioned this story of um, Eugene knowing your name because he was in this daily habit of walking to to work, right, in a sense, and getting to know people's names. So he therefore learned your wife's name and your name before even you knew it. And I can help but think 
that's kind of like what Jesus's ministry must have looked like, right? I mean, 30 years he lived and we don't know much about those 30 years except when he starts the ministry. But I feel like in those 30 years, he got to know people. He got to go places. He got to know, right, the people that were around him. And even as he's doing ministry, I mean, they're going from town to town and acknowledging that there's there's people all around. And uh, well, right now I want to do so, like I want to slow down. And as you were mentioning that Eugene Peterson, when you met him, had just written the message. I have a little uh, two paragraphs that I want to read from the message right here on, on the Bible. And actually, I'm going to play it because the guy that reads it, reads it super well. And then we can discuss how Jesus is slow or how Jesus is late in this paragraph. Sound good? So we're going to slow down to read scripture, whatever long it takes. Sound good? Yes. Awesome. So here we go. A risk of faith. After Jesus crossed over by boat, a large crowd met him at the seaside. One of the meeting place leaders named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his knees beside himself as he begged, My dear daughter is at death's door. Come and lay hands on her so she will get well and live. Jesus went with him, the whole crowd tagging along, pushing and jostling him. A woman who had suffered a condition of hemorrhaging for twelve years. A long succession of physicians had treated her, and treated her badly, taking all her money and leaving her worse off than before, had heard about Jesus. She slipped in from behind and touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, If I can put a finger on his robe, I can get well. The moment she did it, the flow of blood dried up. She could feel the change and knew her plague was over and done with. At the same moment, Jesus felt energy discharging from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said, What are you talking about? With this crowd pushing and jostling you, you're asking, Who touched me? Dozens have touched you. But he went on asking, looking around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened, knowing she was the one, stepped up in fear and trembling, knelt before him, and gave him the whole story. Jesus said to her, Daughter, you took a risk of faith, and now you're healed and whole. Live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. While he was still talking, some people came from the leader's house and told him, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus overheard what they were talking about and said to the leader, Don't listen to them. Just trust me. Just Trust me, don't listen to them. Wow. I mean, it seems like the story is going one way, and then in the middle of the story, there's this whole parenthesis, right? They're talking about Jairus' daughter being sick. He's on the way to get her healed. And then this woman touches Jesus, and then everything stopped. There's the parenthesis right there. And then he, I mean, this woman is healed. He interacts with her. And then by this time, somebody shows up and says, hey, don't even bother coming. You know, the, the, the daughter of Jairus is dead, right? And I can't help but think of the pace and the rhythms of God, how it seems like Jesus is late to everything. First, this woman has had a blood um, problem for 12 years. I mean... That's such a long time, right? And you could say, well, where has God been like all those 12 years? Why did he wait? Why did he not do it in the first year, or in the first month, or in the first day? Why did 12 years happen? And then uh, the other one is, I mean, the daughter is now dead, right? So you have two examples of, of Jesus being late. In both, he does the miracle of healing, right? In one, it involves dead. And in the other one, it involves sickness. So, and we just read it in the MSG version, which is just so helpful. Like, you no, know, Jesus discharged energy and uses words like this that are just so helpful. So what do you feel, um, Matt, when, when you hear these passages in relationship to, I mean, for people that don't believe in God sometimes, 
right? Like, hey, man, why would I even pursue a God that he's always late, right? <laughs> or I can go to a doctor and get healed versus uh, waiting 12 years for meeting Jesus and being healed. You've summarized it beautifully, the idea of Jesus being late. And you're paraphrasing a guy named Teilhard de Chardin, who said, trust the slow work of God. Mm. Trust the slow work of God. He was a Christian scientist who was beginning to discover just how long it took to create the world. And what you see Jesus doing in that passage is what God has been doing for all of history. He seems to be moving at a different speed. You already pointed out that the first 30 years of Jesus' life were spent getting water from the well, making benches, leaning over his neighbor's fence, learning their name. And even once the three years of more intense work began, everything was still face-to-face. Everything was known through people who were named. There was always electricity not existing So always, every night, a fire and a conversation. There was always meals. There was always walking. There was Sabbath and Sabbath keeping. There were festivals to go to Jerusalem. Jesus lived a much healthier life than many Christians do today. And Jesus is not exceptional to God. Jesus is revealing God. So I would say all the way back even in Genesis, when the first image of God that we see is the Spirit hovering, dwelling over the waters in no hurry, but going to take time to bring life out of this tohu wabohu death and darkness. So that's the first image God gives himself. And then we see him taking at least seven days, if they're literal days, or maybe much longer, to create the world and make man and make woman. And then even after they fall, we see him walking in the garden in the cool of the day as though one of his favorite things to do is to go walking. So this is who God is in Genesis, but we get the most face-to-face encounter in Jesus Christ. And God lives at God's speed which doesn't always mean slow. I want to make this point. The film was not to call people to chill out and slow down. There's a time for that, but there's a time for everything. And in my own life, there's moments when I am walking and not growing faint, running, but not growing weary, and sometimes flying on wings like eagles. That's life on earth. But if I'm not living at a speed at which I am knowing God and being known by God, knowing others and getting to know myself better by sins and my gifts. That's why God speeds the pace of being known. It's not just slow down. It's the pace of being known. And so that's what Eugene and Jim began to teach us who ran into school too busy, wanted to impress, wanted to change the world. They were changing the world one person, one name, one relationship at a time, And it's because that's the way Jesus did it and the way God has always done it. And I wonder why, um, like this pace is is intentional and relational. And when I think of of God's work, like you said, you know, like he he spent time one-on-one and that's how you change the world. Uh, you were talking about this uh, when we were talking uh, no, last week about this idea of homo socialis and homo economus. And I wanted to pair that a little bit with like the pace that this world is going at, right? Like the, the speed that this world is going at is it's almost like it's it's normal for us to get on a freeway and go at 75 miles an hour. And there's only so much information we can digest as we're driving at that speed right maybe a sign that says exit here maybe a sign that says you know gas station on the next exit but it's a way different pace than when you walk and you go three miles an hour and even you know in in one of the videos you were saying something like 
for people nowadays, the idea of going three or four miles an hour walking sounds even scary. Like like slowing down in this sense, not not like you said, it doesn't mean go retreat and live no as a hermit or something. Um, but this idea of slowing down is like, w are you kidding me? Our world is it's fast. Our world is the faster, the better, right? The more speed, the better. Um, so how can we thrive as humans in this? Or how can we invite people that are living at this pace to slow down? Well, in our church, um, right now I'm in the junior high room. Um, we try, and we all live busy lives. It's not, if you come to church in Wenatchee, you're not going to find people chilling out. We're working hard. Um, we're suffering. We're trying to find ways. But we try and live at the pace of being known. So whether through small groups or spiritual direction or friendships or during Lent, we go for a 40-day walk where each day, each person walks for 15 minutes a day. It's not that long, but the long obedience in the same direction of 15 minutes a day slows us down. We try not to shop at big stores. We try and shop at local stores. That's why I was showing you my local shop. We try and get things done locally, not online. Uh, I still have not purchased anything from Amazon in my whole life. And it's not just that I'm opposed to some of their practices. It's more that I want to support local businesses and people I know who are trying to make it, especially now during the pandemic when local businesses are suffering. So we're still in the world, but we're trying not to be of it. We want to engage with our neighbors and with God in ways that know him, know ourselves, and know one another. Or as Jesus put it, love God love our neighbor as ourself. And so those are some of the ways we do it in Wenatchee. You saw some of the ways we did it in Scotland. And each parish has to discern responses that we give to the world by following Jesus, who is trying to help us resist the world, not just for resistance sake, but for life more abundant. I wish you could see our people come back from their 15-minute walk or a discussion after church on Sunday, out this window is our grass. And, you know, sometimes people say for five minutes, sometimes they run away. Last Sunday, we were there for an hour and 15 minutes talking about the sermon, talking about politics, because we have Republicans and Democrats at our church, learning how to do this in a way that doesn't point fingers at others, but keeps letting Jesus point at us and change each one of us. That's the pace of being known and changed and loved. Mm. Wow, that's so good. And wow, that's so good when you say, you know, Jesus pointing at us. And I feel like even when you said, when we were talking at the beginning, you said that you were going uh, through a little bit of a deconstruction and that, you know, you were in a fundamentalist church. And I mean, that's, that's an interesting idea because I feel like um, a lot of people right now can identify with, with deconstruction, right? Like I, I feel like in America, maybe possibly in the world or in the Western church, um, like people realize, hey, I, this pace is not for me, right? This, this Godspeed thing may not be for me, but I feel like as humans, there's always something that's intrinsically wanting to connect, wanting to relate, wanting to, to find a more healthy rhythm, right? And even in our other conversation we had on the phone, you said, well, I, I always thought of pastors as lame, right? Like, I don't want to be a pastor. That's a lame job. Um, something along those lines. But then yeah. you said that you met a pastor, Eugene Peterson, who you thought, well, this guy, if this If this is what it's like being a pastor, then it's actually appealing, right? Like, I'm in. And you said it's the pastor should be the healthiest person in the congregation, right? So how can we, how do we become healthy? Like, or how can, 
even if in this sense of like deconstructing, where do we find this this healthiness for people in leadership, right? Or if when when we don't see people in leadership that are healthy, uh, it's almost like if I play devil's advocate, I can say, yeah, it's it's not worth joining that group or that community, right? <laughs> What do you feel when you hear these things? Well, first, I have a real heart for anyone being deconstructed. And that could be a whole nother podcast. I had the gift of being deconstructed in the late 1990s. But instead of wrecking my faith, um, I discovered my faith in ways that were so beautiful. Um, as it relates to Eugene being the healthiest person in the congregation, yeah, looking at his life, I thought pastors were so lame. I grew up in a business world where you should both be a Christian and use it as a platform to help people come to Christ. Pastors were guys who just couldn't get a real job. That was my attitude. But in meeting Eugene, I met somebody so healthy that I thought, if the main job of the pastor is to be the most healthy person in Christ, so that anyone in the congregation will not look up to him as an idol, but look across to him as a brother whose life in Christ is sustainable, healthy, still married, working hard but not too hard, playing, keeping Sabbath. I wanted that and so pursued that, obviously, because now I'm a pastor. As it relates to your third thing you said, which I've now forgotten. Do you remember? Possibly. I forget things. But I was, was saying deconstruction. I was saying rhythms. I was saying healthy. And I was saying leadership. So does it relate to those? Well, there's clearly a leadership crisis right now. Um, I don't know if you've been listening to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Um, but whether Mars Hill in particular, or the American church in general, one reason we're being deconstructed is because we haven't had healthy leadership or healthy congregations. And so that's why there's something near and dear to my heart. You also mentioned um, homo socialis or homo economis, you know, economic man or social man. And one reason I think the West has begun to crumble is because we've idolat we've made an idol out of the economy and money and moving fast. When we made God speed, it wasn't saying we figured out how to live at a better way. God speed was a confession saying, Mia culpa, I am in trouble. I need to repent of the ways I'm slowly running myself down. And when we released Godspeed here in Wenatchee, it was first in English, and many people came, and because it was a largely Caucasian, English-speaking theater, they were all, like, moved, wanting to repent. Um, this was back in 2013 or 14. I'm bad at numbers. Um, well, then we put it in Spanish subtitles, and... I went to some in the community called Norma Gallegos, and I said, Norma, um, this Godspeed film, first help me translate Godspeed into a Spanish phrase. And we eventually came up with, vaya con Dios, go with God. Um, and I had Norma look at the film, and she smiled, and she said, Matt, I've got good news. Um, the Latino community is living at Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe we can help you repent and become social human beings mm. who don't worship speed or money or power. And of course, you know, that was back when it was in the last two or three years, these things have really come to the fore. So I'm grateful for my Spanish speaking brothers and sisters who are helping me live at God's speed But that's an ongoing confession and repentance. And we need homo socialis, which is the two-thirds world, to help us recover what Jesus was trying to teach us in the first century. But back then, everybody got it. 
Um, there were other problems, but we need to walk again in Christ with one another in ways that we have stopped walking because it's tearing us apart. Wow. That is true. And well, I love this idea of perish. And even, even when you use the word repent, because I feel like, uh, well, first I would love for you to expand on this idea of perish because I think the the regular people, the normal people that hears parish thinks, oh, a church building or a, you know a place where you go and and be with God or something, but not through the videos and through talking to you, I realize that parish is bigger than that. It has a, a way more nuance and and bigger meaning than that. Um, so first, can you tell us a little bit about this idea of of parish, and then from there, I would love to move on to what is sin and what is repentance. So I thought perish meant to die, like John the Baptist, mm. repent or perish, die. But when I showed up to Scotland, the word perish, P-A-R-I-S-H, meant a piece of land. And all of Scotland is divided into parishes. There's a village in the middle. There's farmland around about. And the church is in the middle of the parish, next to the school, next to the pub, next to all the essential things of parish life. So when I showed up to work in Scotland as a parish assistant, my first question was, where's my office? And the head minister looked at me like an idiot. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, I don't have an office. I'm the assistant. I said, where's your office? <laughs> But he still looked at me like an idiot because Alan McDonald didn't have an office. His home phone number is on the church sign, and you can call him anytime at home. Not a cell phone. This was a landline. And his office was the parish. Our job was to be at the schools, at the pub, leading the funerals, leading the football game, if we could play soccer, a minister in the life of their community, bearing witness to Christ as a neighbor. So the parish is just the neighborhood. And my job as a pastor was not just to work inside the church. That was about half the time, maybe two thirds. The other half or third was in the parish, loving my neighbor. And that mixture of pastor and evangelist, or just call all of it being a good neighbor in Christ, was thrilling. I loved my job as a pastor. And I've tried to translate that now into Wenatchee, which is a little harder. Nobody wants me knocking on their door. Um, but I play ball at the YMCA down the street, and I know those guys. I get my hair cut at the other place down the street where I don't drive to, but I walk to. I'm trying to translate what I lived in Scotland onto American soil, and it works because we have neighborhoods. We do have this thing. Um, we want to get to sin. Um, the phone, which is the one thing that jeopardizes parish because instead of going face to face with people, I'm constantly invaded by my phone, but I've learned to work with the phone as a phone, not a dictator. And so parish is just the word for the land God has given you to live in. And if you remember that God's first question in the Bible is, where are you? Adam and Eve have fallen into sin. He doesn't say, how did you sin? He actually says, where are you? A geographical question. I wish Adam and Eve would have said, here we are. Help. Instead, they start pointing fingers at each other, at the devil, and even at God. I believe God's first question, where are you, was meant to help us say, here I am. I have sinned, and I'm going to stop hiding. In fact, If you keep following the Old Testament, each significant figure answers God with the word hineni, which is Hebrew, but in English it's here I am. An answer to that original question God asked walking in the garden that Adam and Eve failed to answer. Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Jacob, and eventually Mary all say here I am. In my parish, 
I don't have to go far away. You have found me right here. Mm. What do you want me to do right here? And Jesus, of course, doesn't just ask, where are you? He becomes the here I am for us on earth so that in his baptism, in his death, in his resurrection, I now live and move and have my being in Wenatchee as a part of the body of Christ. So that begins to address some sin questions, but it starts with your question about what is parish. And I would say it's the land, the neighborhood God has put you in to know and be known. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. And yeah, it's uh, I love what you said about the question, the first question in the Bible, right? Uh, where are you? And I think that's, It's almost like a philosophical question that anybody can ask and maybe philosophers throughout the, the eras have asked, right? Like, who are we? Where are we? What is, what is earth? What is this world? And I feel like a lot of people, even if they're not Christian or they're, they don't, may not have faith or something like that, I feel like this question uh, gets at the heart of who we are. Like, where are you, right? And you were going to say something? Well, I'm, so next week I'll meet with a non-Christian. Mm. Um, and my first question is going to be, where are you? Mm. I don't start with, why is Jesus late? Which is a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. It always starts with, where are you? That's God's first question. Because you realize that just in answering, you are beginning to be found. Mm. And anybody can answer it because everyone is in a place both geographically and emotionally and spiritually and physically. God is an embodied God. The earth is an embodied place. Humans are embodied people. That's why where are you was such a great first question to get the whole Bible story rolling to land in Christ saying, here I am on our behalf. So that now anybody who has faith in Christ and says, here I am, I trust you. I trust your slow work. I trust your revolutionary message of being face to face. Mm. Teach me to love God, love my neighbor and love myself. That's the here I am response that I pray leads to revival, both in our country and it's already happening in most places in the world. Mm. America is just at a particularly proud moment where we're pointing fingers rather than confessing sins. Wow. This is, this is so good. And I mean, when we were talking on the phone last week too, you said, um, I, I asked you the question like, Matt, what is sin? You know, I, I forgot exactly what led us to that, but you, you mentioned that sin has, there's like five definitions and you mentioned two. And one was, I think a lot of people are familiar with it. It's sin is missing the mark, right? But then you mentioned another one that I've never heard before. And it just made so much sense. And you said sin is broken relationship. And you said that when the Bible uses the word righteousness, it means rightly related and I can help but think of even as you're talking right now we're you no know, in America pointing the finger and how maybe other countries have a bit of an advantage over the Western civilization right like you said um, Mrs. Gallegos was saying hey no we <laughs> we're already living at God's speed right in a sense uh, that's so good but I feel like to I mean the question is where are you and I feel like maybe right now, in the context of America and in the context of the influence of this country among the world. And even, even as I think, Matt, like, honestly, I, I, I feel like, you know, people like Jim Houston and Eugene Peterson and you, Matt Canlis, I feel like you are, you are trying to bring people to this rightly related position. And you're like, we got to do it in our neighborhoods. We got to do it in our parish in the place where we're at, in our location, in our geography. So can you elaborate a little bit on this idea of sin as broken relationships? 
I can, and it's not my idea. It's another mentor from Regent College. His name is Bruce Waltke. And Bruce was the chairman of the NIV Old Testament Committee. Amazing man, taking his Old Testament classes, watching him read from the Hebrew text, preach to us about who God is and where we are. He was the one who taught us that righteousness means rightly related or rightly connected. You know, when I heard the word righteous, I think I always think self-righteous. This kind of proud, I'm self-righteous. No, no, no. Righteousness is the most beautiful word. It means rightly related to God, to my neighbors, to myself in Christ, and to the earth. Hmm. So I think there's a cross next to me. Think of the connections God makes for us in Christ to be rightly connected, rightly related. So that's what righteousness means, right relationships, rightly related. Sin shatters righteousness. It breaks all those connections that we're meant to have with God and with each other and with the earth and with ourselves in Christ. So Christ's righteousness triumphs over human sin and brokenness as we welcome his work in our life by the Holy Spirit. That's my hope is that we can recover righteousness as a righteous word that will make us think of Jesus saying, love God and your neighbor and yourself. That's, that's the heart of righteousness. And it exposes what sin really is. Sin isn't just breaking commands or breaking rules or missing the mark. It is also those things. But all of those things are in the service of trying to restore relationship. And that's something America needs right now. We've always needed it. We're just more aware because of our more obvious sin and brokenness now. Wow. Yeah. And as an avatar, I can relate because even uh, no, a few minutes ago, you lifted up your phone and you said there's ways to interact with it. And even you have chosen to almost like strategically uh, relate to the phone as a phone. right? And even to think that... A phone is it's way more than a phone nowadays, right? It's a place to interact, but it's also almost like a place to, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, for a lot of just minds on the internet, it's just a way to say whatever you want to say without even thinking of the consequences that your words can have, right? And I mean, I, you said you don't have Facebook, you don't have Instagram, you have Twitter and these things. But I witness that almost every day. And I feel like, I, I don't know if maybe as a society, this is, I mean, for sure it's, it's part of the problem. Uh, but I wonder if there's a way to heal even in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Like even, even, I mean, even through this podcast, I feel like that, that's one of the goals and the ideas to bring a solution as we talk, as we interact, as we discuss these, these themes and invite people to consider them, right? But where do people listen to this podcast? On the internet. Where do people see it? On YouTube. Where do people see it? On Facebook. Like all these places. And there's so much information. I think that's that's one of the things we were talking about in, in one of our first talks. Like the world doesn't need more information, <laughs> right? It's already out there. And it's almost like a fire hydrant of, of data, coming into you and sometimes all you need to do is like strip it away and feel like no this this one piece is is the one i need like out of all the data in the world out of all the information all i need is this one and and find a way to fix these broken relationships and i would like to end on this matt um when we were talking the other day you said What time is it right now? You know, you mentioned there's there's times to walk, there's times to run, and there's times to fly. And and I love this idea of Jesus. When he's doing ministry, he says, I only do what I see the Father doing, right? And I feel like, okay, that he, he does what it's when the time is right. <laughs> and he knows what his time is. And... What do you think 
How can we imp invite people to consider this question in their own lives? Like, what time is it right now? It's a great question, and it's coming from Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for everything. And what time is it now? A few things come to mind. First, I love what you said about how do we redeem technology. And Beto, the gift you gave me was instead of just having me on for an hour to give some information, you let us build a relationship mm. so that whatever information we give in this podcast, you and I have begun a conversation that is bigger than information. Mm. So that has to happen alongside of technology so that technology facilitates relationship. Whenever technology fights relationship, it is contributing to sin, to broken relationship. So tech, and this is a good example, can facilitate relationship. But I also don't want people, when they're asked, where are you, to ever say, I'm on my phone. Mm. No. Or I'm on the internet. No. Um, I am in the junior high room at church, um, talking to you through whatever this is, um, a <laughs> Zoom meeting. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to be at lunch with my brother-in-law because he has a break and I miss him and I love him. And that's what time it is. It is time to recover our friendships and our relationships. Wow. It is time to recover our friendship and our relationships. Matt, Thank you so much. I want to be conscious of your time and of your relationships that you have. Mm -hmm. Even as you said uh, the other day, you said, no, I took time to to be with my daughter and have coffee. And now you're saying you want time to be with your brother. And I think that's a great invitation. I I love this idea of you know, even having lunch with people or coffee and and going out with people and spending time in in building relationships. And I'm just super thankful, Matt, that, as you said, we are, in a sense, redeeming um, redeeming what, what the Internet can look like. By I, I just love what you did, Matt, that you invited me to have a relationship with you rather than, okay, yeah, let's go on a podcast and here's more information for, for an audience, right? No, let's build these relationships. And you, you, you taught me by example. Right. So I'm super appreciative of that. Is there one last thought you would love to say to the audience as, as we close up this episode? Not the audience, um, but to you. Um, I look forward to I'll give you a call next week and we'll follow up on your son's birthday, how it went, what's happening down in Southern California. Um, so I'm glad that this podcast was a part of a conversation you and I are having. And to all the listeners, you know, don't just have a friendship with a stranger like Beto. <laughs> do have limits. It's not like I do this with everybody I meet. I don't do many podcasts and things. So Godspeed starts at home. Spend time with your family. Then it starts with your friends and your church. Spend time with your friends in church. Don't go knocking on doors like in Godspeed. It gives the impression that I go knocking on doors everywhere. I don't do that anymore. That was in Scotland where it was expected. Where are you right now? What are the relationships that you have? And how can you take time to know and be known? Wow. So good. Matt Canlis, you're the author of this little book I have right here called Godspeed. And you guys can find it in livegodspeed.org and Matt you said there's another book um, about a pilgrim there is there's a book called Backyard Pilgrim Backyard Pilgrim which was the sequel to the film because when people watched Godspeed they started dreaming about Scotland and greener grass over there so Backyard Pilgrim was written to say become a pilgrim in your own backyard in your own parish The where are you question is meant to be answered where you already are. So it's a 40-day pilgrimage of 15 minutes a day walking with Jesus in your own neighborhood. Love it. Thank you so much, Matt. And again, 
Like I said, you can find this at livegodspeed.org. That's the only place where you can find it. So I'll have it on, this, on the show notes too. Uh, you can visit christianpodcast.com and then go there, see the episode, and then go get these books. My church is going through through these books with the you know the eldership here in, in our church, so in our congregation. So it would, would be awesome if you guys want to do something like that, right? Take the course, see the videos, take your time, and even start implementing some of these, these ideas, crazy ideas, like going for a 15-minute walk, <laughs> right? So good. Thank you so much, Matt. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I will. Thank you.